Services. I am um, one of the coordinators of the Zendo Project. If you haven't heard of the Zendo Project, we provide a safe space for people who are having challenging psychedelic experiences at music festivals. If you haven't visited the Zendo space behind the Wookiee stage, feel free to go by there and stop by and say hi to the rest of my team. Um, I've been working in psychedelic integration um, I would say my whole life, but um, professionally for the past five years. <coughs> um, and I also uh, provide harm reduction um, services and sanctuary spaces at about 20 different um, music festivals and events a year. And one of the things that I've found um, about providing these services to this community is it's very short-term crisis work. And a lot of people who have really intense psychedelic experiences need long-term integration. So it's one of the reasons we started Inner Space Integration was to provide a space where people can people can receive long-term continuous care um, post um, psychedelic experience that has caused some sort of personal, spiritual, or psychological transformation and they need some more assistance, professional help to be able to um, integrate that into their daily life. And so I will be talking a little bit more about self-care for the individual and self-care for the sitters in the community that are helping those people go through that. Um, and I'm totally blessed to see all your beautiful faces. And so I'll pass the mic to Sheree. She'll tell you a little bit about herself. <laughs> Hi everyone, thank you so much for showing up. Uh, we're super excited because um, Inner Space Innovation, as Ashley said, is a, a fairly new um, venture that we just started and uh, this is our first ever festival talk. Um, and you guys are the first ever to hear the content that we're about to speak about as well. So thanks for being a part of this. Um, and here's to many, many more. Um, and about myself, so my name is Cherie Malcolm Godassi. Uh, I live in Los Angeles, California. Um, I just completed graduate school. I studied psychology with a focus on um, psychedelic integration therapy and specializing in uh, spiritual, psycho spiritual, and depth psychology. Um, I also uh, am a psycho spiritual coach and um, what else? I'm also one of the, um, along with Erica, this is actually oh, very exciting to announce, I if I may. Yes, of course. Um, so, is, are you, any of you guys familiar with MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies that have been doing amazing work for the last 30 years? Yes? Okay. So, um, as you probably know, MAPS um, privately funds out of um, donations um, clinical studies um, to, uh, to really try and prove that psychedelics actually do have uh, some sort of a medical um, benefit. What? Benefit. Benefit. <laughs> that they are beneficial um, and they're, they're funding clinical, clinical research and clinical studies to prove the efficacy of these medicines. And um, one study that has been going on for the past few years is um, MDMA uh, for the treatment of um, uh, post-traumatic stress disorders. Um, and phase three is about to start in Los Angeles in 2017. And I'm really happy to announce that Erica and I have, are um, two of the co-therapists in Los Angeles out of a team of seven. So that's something that we're both going to start um, in the next uh, six months or so. Uh, so that's super exciting as well. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, and so that's a, a little bit about me and the reason that I got into this medicine work. So unlike these two goddesses, I'm actually fairly new um, into the psychedelic world. I've only started really experimenting with uh, medicines only in the past few years. And for me personally, I've just had such impactful, strong experiences that I found myself after these journeys just really not really understanding how to like take all this beauty that I saw, the knowledge that I've learned, all these lessons that I've received, and not really knowing what to do with them, and um, really, like, I noticed that I was really looking to speak with people, and uh, do a lot of, uh, just some sort of an expression of my work to see, like, what was really coming out of these medicines for me, and then um, speaking to more and more people, 
Um, it was really nice to learn that other people have been real, also having really um, impactful experiences themselves. So the, the more we spoke, the more we saw the need for a community. Um, and that was what brought me personally to kind of have like an awakening and realize that maybe this is a needed service. And I literally dropped everything in my life and went back to school to study this. Um, and in terms of um, inner space specifically, this is kind of a neat story. So um, last September, um, anyone here uh, has been to the or have heard of the visionary uh, plant, plant teachers visionary convergence in Los Angeles? Anyone? Yes, 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 yes. Perfect. Um, so it was an incredible weekend of all these psychedelic like. Jedi's and visionaries coming together and just holding all these talks and you, you know what happens when all these uh, this the medicine energy comes together a lot of things start boiling up and start like a lot of creation starts rising up and the entire weekend was like one long journey and there was one time at one of the talks there were simultaneous talks going on at all times for three days straight and Ashley and I were sitting in the same huge hall, listening to a talk, but we were sitting in two like completely different, like, I was sitting in one corner of the room, she was sitting on the complete other corner of the room, and just listening to this talk, and um, I guess we were both kind of inspired. I wrote in my notebook, psychedelic integration, just like off the top of my head, just I was kind of like inspired by something that I heard in the talk, I don't, I'm not really sure what it was, but I just wrote it in my notebook, and then at the end of the talk, I went over and like, I met Ashley, and I said, Ash, like, what did you think? Wasn't this an amazing talk? And she looks at me and she says, psychedelic integration. We have to do something with psychedelic integration. And I couldn't believe it. I looked at her and I just opened my notebook to show her that like five minutes earlier I wrote the exact same thing. And we kind of made a vow at that moment, that was seven months ago, to make it happen. And it happened. So inner space happened. And, and that came from our own integration of the vision that we had there. Um, and that's actually going to bring me about what integration is, I think. Right? Is there anything else we need to speak about before we do that? Let's do it. Cool. Let's do it. So, um, in preparation for that, I'm actually going to pass out these beautiful cards that we made for you. If you want to take that over there. Oh, just pass that out, just sit please. Here. Cool. <laughs> And on these beautiful cards, you'll find a little um, explanation of, which we're going to go over in just a minute, but explanation of what is integration exactly, um, as well as kind of like um, a do-it-yourself preparation and survival guide that you can keep handy and use whenever you feel the need to, uh, uh, for some strategies. Um, to either ground into the work or ground out of it. So if you want to look at your cards, we can kind of go over it together for a second. So what is integration? It's going to be on, on, the, on the back of the card on the top. Um, integration is an intentional process of creating space for the body, heart, mind, and psyche to reorganize after an impactful experience. Now, it doesn't say psychedelics on the card. Unfortunately, we still live in a time where these medicines in the United States are, um, they're scheduled as Schedule 1, uh, which means that they, they are illegal. Uh, so here we talk about altered states of consciousness. Uh, for the sake of this talk, you know, this is like a festival. Maybe some of you have done it, maybe not, but we're going to talk specifically about how to integrate other states of consciousness with psychedelic medicines. You can keep that in mind. Um, and integration invites the conscious adjustments of perspectives and habits to incorporate new knowledge and ideas in favor of promoting growth and well-being. So basically what it says um, is that when, you, when we experience altered states of consciousness, what happens there is something that's really unique because we, got, we kind of get um, a beautiful, rare opportunity to step out of our ego identity. Our ego identity is basically everything that we have come to know consciously and recognize and acknowledge. Um, and uh, we get a glimpse into something else and something new that we might have never seen before. And, um, it's so so uh, powerful that we're looking for ways to kind of um, bring it back into life and make use of these lessons to uh, to really use them for our benefit and to just 
um, promote our growth and well-being. So you can do this in many different aspects, and here we're going to talk about uh, three specific um, aspects of integrating. I'm going to talk about spiritual integration, because that's my forte. Ashley's going to talk about somatic, because that's what she does, that's her thing. And Erica's going to talk about this, whatever she's going to talk about, <laughs> which is everything else. Um, so that's what we're going to touch upon right now. Thanks, Sheree. Thank you. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is self-care, and um, especially it's Sunday at a festival, and it is really hot out, and we are probably underslept and under hydrated and underfed, maybe a little bit exhausted and a little bit more sensitive to energy, um, to other people's energy and to your own energy, and that in itself is a process. It's really important to recognize that um, although in this context we're talking about psychedelic integration, um, it's any altered state. It's through holotropic breath work, it's through kundalini yoga, it's through any kundalini awakening um, that might have happened um, in addition to um, integration that needs to happen through the use of psychedelics. <laughs> um, and so, who here has had an intense psychedelic or altered state experience. <laughs> um, who here has had um, an extended period of time after that um, after that episode in which you kind of like didn't know what to do or didn't know how to take care of yourself? Perfect. It's like it's at least half of you out there. Um, and so it's really, really important that when you start looking at self-care, that you need to recognize that like self-care is based on your individual need. What works for someone else might not work for you. And so the most important thing is to slow yourself down and really check in with, with what you actually need. You know, I talk a lot about it um, in harm reduction um, when people are actually going through those altered states of consciousness. It's like some people need to be like held and, and given like a physical container to be able to feel safe. And some people want absolutely no physical contact at all, right? And so you have these, these like kind of polar opposites about what you um, actually need. So the step one of self-care is checking in with yourself and identifying what your needs are. One of the hardest things we have um, to do is actually being able to ask for what we need and ask for what we want. Because um, it's very scary. A lot of us, I've, all of us have had experiences in our life where we have felt like we've reached out and the people we're reaching out to are failing us or not doing what we need what we want them to do or need them to do. And so there's this innate fear that if you actually ask for what you want or for what you need, that you're not going to get that. With that being said, it's very important to be able to reach out to what you define as your community for that type of support. And it's very important for, for you as a community to reflect back to individuals whether or not you yourself are, are in a space to be able to provide the care that somebody needs. And so one of the things um, about self-care is really being able to seek help and support in a constructive environment, but also recognize that sometimes that won't happen. And so it's really important to be able to reach out to multiple people, to reach out to multiple aspects of community. A lot of times, um, being a therapist, a lot of times people have a lot of fear about going and actually seeking professional help and they want to go and seek help from their friends or help from their community. As community members, when you see a friend who is in that type of crisis, maybe that's something that you can be like, you want to know something? Like, this might be too much for me. Like, maybe you should actually go talk to a professional and find a compassionate professional. One of the things that um, MAPS provides, you can reach out to MAPS through their website, um, uh, and they have a list of uh, therapists all over the country who specialize in psychedelic integration. For people, for professionals who are compassionate to this type of work and this type of experience. 
And so a lot of times um, it can be scary, but really reaching out, asking for help, asking for support, checking in with yourself. In addition to that, um, self-care, um, it's really important after an intense experience to kind of create ritual. And that can be anything from having a morning mindfulness practice to starting to go to yoga, to starting to eat healthier, to starting to, to create some sort of pattern in your life in which you can actually be able to be present and check in with yourself. And so really being able to, whether it is you know, a, a somatic practice or whether it is breathing exercises or whether it's, I don't know, I might get like finger wagged in this community for it. It might be like, I'm going to take 30 minutes a day to like zone out and watch television because I need my mind to stop. And I know some of you are, are, are anti-TV people, but <laughs> uh, you know, it's really, it's whatever is working for you to provide the grounding and provide the space for you to have self-compassion. Um, it's also really important to recognize like what you are going through is a process. Some days will be better than others. Some days you'll feel like you're making a ton of progress and sometimes you'll feel like you're back to where you were when you first started. And so um, one of the things that one of my good friends always tells to me, says to me, is kind of like, Look where you were two weeks ago. Look where you were three months ago. Look where you were six months ago. Like, are you making progress? Are you making changes? Are you, are you growing in a direction that you feel proud of? And if you're not, like, that's the areas of your life where you actually need to start, you know, shining light into those shadows um, and being able to look at yourself and look at your community. And so one of the things we're really doing at Inner Space, um, we have um, monthly um, community meetings for people who are kind of seeking support. Um, a lot of people who have um, <clears throat> intense experiences that need integration feel like a lot of their friends or family won't understand what's going on with them. And so it's really important. And we, we come talk to us afterwards and we would be super happy to kind of help you create some guidance around creating a support system in your own communities um, outside of Los Angeles. I know we're starting up in, in San Diego soon, and there's some really good um, integration work going on in the Bay Area as well. And so really, being patient with yourself, being patient with the process, um, and kind of understanding that like we're all going through our own process whether it's, whether it's psychedelic integration work or not. And it's really important to be so, like, soft and gentle with yourself and understanding with yourself that like, you know, we're all going to get through this together um, and that we're all kind of, we're all in the same boat. Everybody's going through something um, that just presents itself differently. Um, to talk just a little bit about sitter self-care, if you are a friend or a family member um, or somebody who actually sat through somebody's intense experience, it's really um, also important to um, recognize like your own scope of work. If something's getting too intense for you to handle, it's okay to reach out. It's okay to actually say, like, this is a little too intense for me. Let me get you some other supports. Like, you don't have to put yourself through the traumatic experience um, for somebody else because that's not good self-care. The thing that is good self-care is being able to be present and acknowledge, like, your own process and your own piece of the puzzle and really be able to um, ask for help. Um, and really being able to create what looks like or feels like a safe space for processing. Um, and so I'd love to talk to you guys. I, we're going to have a Q&A at the after if you guys have any more um, questions about self-care or, or sitter techniques or things like that. I'd love to talk to all of you after. And I'm going to pass the microphone to Ashley who's going to kind of talk about a little bit more somatic um, body integration.
part of the uh, evolution I feel like I've gone through in my own process, uh, my background is actually in science and nothing to do with counseling. <laughs> um, but I, I felt like um, that early part of my life was really the development of my mind. Um, and then as I started to come into this community and um, using some of these uh, substances for personal work, I feel like it's been this development of my heart and this blossoming of my heart space. And now what I feel like I'm moving into now is a connection with my body. And it's been re a really stunning unfolding. And in the training that I'm doing right now, Hakomi, um, which is a somatic-based psychotherapy program, and somatic just means having to do with the body. So I'm just putting that out there. Um, is witnessing firsthand that there's this innate, beautiful, divine, healing potential in all of us. And through the process of being human and being born on this planet, we accumulate baggage. And I would say most of us have been carrying around that baggage for so long and that can be really heavy. And it's kind of because we haven't found a safe place to put it down. And so for me, in my own definition of integration, creating a safe container for that unfolding to happen. And I've, I've been watching it both in myself and the people around me to just watch this energy come through people and just reorganize the whole system. And it's fascinating and I think that we're just barely scratching the surface of what that potential is. So I'm really excited to, uh, to be exploring that more. There's a really great quote by uh, John Larnsbury, which is, psychotherapy is a gentle unfolding of the soul. So part of what Hakomi is about is being hyper-present and mindful of the present moment. This is the moment where the unconscious and the conscious are linked. When we are thinking about the future, we're thinking about the past, we are in this conscious headspace. And when we come into the present and tune in to what our body is telling us, whatever sensations they may be, that is where the unfolding happens because that is what's happening right now. It is the moment of now, it is, it is, it is that only moment that anything is really happening. Part of um, what makes somatic therapy so powerful is that early life traumas or experiences, or if you do have a, a traumatic experience even anywhere in your life, um, those powerful experiences kind of overload the whole nervous system and short circuits the language centers of the brain. And so those the memories of that, those traumatic or powerful experiences, get stored not as like necessarily a chronological strain of events, but will be images or body sensations and this sort of fragmented sort of uh, memory. And I don't know if any of you had this experience, but I've definitely had it several times where I've gotten to a place where I've been so open and raw and I'm kind of just, these emotions are just welling up and coming out. And, and the way I express my emotions and, and discharge this emotional energy is through crying. And sometimes I don't even know what the crying is linked to. There's no thought associated with it. It's just energy, emotional energy coming through. And it's, it again is sort of short-circuiting that language center. It's just like getting that out of the way so this stuff can emerge. The way that the psychedelic medicines that we use that are similar in this work is that they work in the same sort of symbolic language. So many of you, I'm sure, have had uh, visionary experiences where it's not really that the, the message that are coming through is coming through in a chronological story. It's like a dream where 
images or sounds or uh, little fragments of, of words or phrases will come to you and it's speaking in that same language as the body and the whole nervous system. So when we're present with the body and present with whatever is happening right now, the body give that we give the unconscious permission to speak for our for our to our conscious mind. So it our unconscious speaks in those symbolic languages. It doesn't speak in the same way that our head or frontal cortex speaks in. And so when we're in that present moment, we're feeling it's speaking to us, and we're creating a space for that dialogue to happen. And when we get quiet. We can hear that. And when we create and are disciplined about creating space for that to, that quiet voice that doesn't speak in the way that we're commonly used to, it comes up and we begin to develop a relationship and start to understand the symbols. We each have our own symbolic language that is unique to us. We all have our own unique archetypes and it's kind of beautiful because it's, it's this, um, it's like a mystery or a, a discovery process of figuring out what that symbolic language looks like for each of us. So, I don't know, again, another, coming back to that overload of the nervous system, I don't know if you guys have seen this before, but have you ever seen like a, um, a gazelle being chased by a lion and then it gets away and after that it has to like shake and kick and and the thing is that most animals do that and we don't really do that and what was people are starting to figure out is that what that is is this discharge of that adrenaline that energy and what we're doing when we don't like shake out and all that energy is that it gets chopped in the body so that concept of emotional discharge has been a really powerful one for me. Being able to, when something moves through, making sure that I continue that movement. You know, whether that's something that's in my body or I let myself cry or shaking it out. Just shake, you know, I'm sure you've all been to some yoga classes where the teacher's like shake, 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 shake. <laughs> And that's exactly what you're doing. It's it's shaking out this this stuck energy, you know, and it may not be anything you really understand where it came from, but it's an important process of moving the energy through. And I don't know if we completely understand what that energy is at this point. And I don't think we necessarily need to be able to start working with it. And more understanding will come with time. So I want to take um, an opportunity right now to actually do a little exercise where we come into this body awareness. So I'm going to invite you to close your eyes or downcast your eyes, you know, feel comfortable closing your eyes and settle into yourself. Taking some deep breaths. And the mindfulness state that we're inviting in right now is a little bit different than the yoga kind of space because yoga is about sort of deepening and expanding and relaxing but what i want to invite right now is alert mindfulness it's a, a place of observation and a suspending judgment so as you take these deep breaths, coming into the body, what are some of the sensations that are coming up in your body right now in this moment? Do a scan. Some things may be louder than others. There may be a sensation of tension or tingling or warmth or itchiness, whatever the sensation is, just observe. Breathing into that space of observation. Whatever you're feeling right now, and it could be something as, as benign sounding as lightheadedness, 
or itchiness or anything, or it could be as you know deeply emotional as sorrow or pain, or it could be something as beautiful as joy and happiness. Whatever it is, I invite you to hang out, slow down the frames of your experience. Notice every single detail of what is occurring within your body. This may include the voices in your head. We always have several that are going on at the same time. Create space for all of those voices to be held as well. There is space for all of it. There's no need to push away anything. They're all there for a reason. They're all there as be teachers. Breathing into that space, whatever the sensation may be. And as you hang out in that slow, mindful, deepening space, observe if there are any images or sensations or words or movements or sounds that come with that dominant sensation you're feeling right now. As we deepen into our body, the unconsciousness starts to unfold into those symbols, those images. Allowing yourself to be open to what your body wants to present to you right now. This is the space of wisdom. This is the space of healing. Just noticing whatever's coming up for you. And as you take some deep breaths into that space, moving back, pulling up the messages from deep below and the unconscious, bringing them up to the surface. Are there any words or phrases or movements, images that you can distill away from this exquisite moment of now? When I come back, and one of the tools that we use in this integration process is to distill affirmations or movements to ground in and help bring what was brought up from the unconscious into the conscious mind. And then that's something that you can continue during your integration process. Some of the last medicine journeys that I've done have, these affirmations have bubbled up to the surface. And now there are gems, these pearls of wisdom that I can take with me everywhere. So as you breathe into whatever it is that has been distilled for you in this moment, taking a deep breath into that. And when you feel ready, you gently flutter your eyes open. There's a beautiful metaphor that I have been holding with me for a while, and that we are all on this journey together. And we're all, each of us, trying to write the story of the human experience. And we're trying to figure it out. And each one of us has learned some sentences of wisdom or par whole paragraphs. And when we come together in these gatherings and we share our wisdom from one another, it allows us to build that story out of the human experience 
and come into that beautiful richness. So as you come and you interact with the people here and with take those pearls of wisdom that you have discovered in your own self and share them because we're all in this together. We're not alone. Even though it feels like it sometimes. We're not alone. We may be alone in our heads, but we're not alone. to what Ashley was saying and for me my my personal physical manifestation was through yawning I felt like all this energy pent up inside of me that I just really wanted to release and melt into it in this present moment just to be able to let go the cleansing effect the purifying effect um, so with that we'll try to wake up again and um, I would like to uh, present to you um, a few words and a few thoughts about spiritual integration um, of the psychedelic experience. Now, um, for me, spiritual is a very loaded word. It might be for a lot of other people as well. Um, I will attempt to kind of break it down. Um, and have a look at it from a more psychological theory point of view because I think for me, I have never been really, I never thought that I was really a spiritual person up until a couple of years ago. It really didn't mean anything to me. Um, but then the psychedelics really kind of opened me up to that realm and I didn't really know what to do with it until I started studying it. And I really found a couple of um, psychological theories that I want to talk about really useful and that's what I would like to talk um, to bring forward uh, to you. Um, so in the 60s there was uh, a person, I forgot, oh Panky, Panky's Experiment. Anyone familiar with Panky's Experiment? Woo, yes, buddy. awesome. Woo. So in the 60s um, a guy named Pink, uh, Mr. Panky um, decided to um, examine the mystical or spiritual properties of uh, psilocybin mushrooms, and what he did is he went to um, a, uh, I think it was like some school, a monastery school, and he picked out 20 men who were um, students of uh, the monastery, and he gave them uh, mushrooms, magic mushrooms, and just to see if, uh, to kind of see if the mystical, if, if these very spiritual mystical beings will see, will recognize the mushrooms as a spiritual experience. He thought, he thought, what better way to see if the mushrooms can really do work than giving it to people who are familiar with spiritual experiences. Um, so what ended up happening, um, and this is, um, the quotes I'm going to quote now are from, um, um, I derived from uh, Rick Doblin, who was the founder of MAPS. When Rick Doblin was a student, um, in the 80s, 20 years after the, the mushroom experiment, Pinky's Good Friday experiment, he looked for all these people, these 20 men that were in the monastery, to really like, to do a follow-up on them, to really question what has happened with this experience and what did you do with it, and how did it really affect you throughout your life. And uh, he basically found that out of these 20 individuals, 61% claimed to have uh, a full, complete mystical experience. And 94% of those people, meaning probably 19, I think one of them passed away, so that's pretty much everyone he found, um, said that the mushroom experience, the psilocybin experience, was the most spiritual and mystical um, and one of the top five most meaningful experiences of their lives. And this was 20 years later, and it's still after 20 years, it's experience really held true for them. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, and what it really means when you think about it, you know, 61% said that had a complete, like, revelatory mystical experience, and 94% had, had said it has a lot of meaning. 20 years later, when you think about it, you know, so many of us who do try psychedelics and 
it really means that perhaps they really do have the potential to be so meaningful um, and really, really impacting. And perhaps they are mystical and spiritual and we might not have the tools to really recognize what it means. Um, and so Stan Groff, who's a psycho European psychologist who's still alive and kicking and like is working his butt off for the last 40 years, um, and really kind of trying to like decipher psychedelic experiences and the spiritual realm. Um, he is the father of uh, a stream in psychology called the transpersonal psychology. Um, and he really tried with this uh, aspect of psychology to kind of like give answer to like, all these mystical and spiritual experiences that regular psychoanalytics, um, scientific, social science, psychology can really explain. Um, so, Stan Groff says that the transpersonal experience is really a direct experience of other spiritual dimensions, um, that, and they transcend all dimensions of time and space as we know it, um, and these spaces contain a lot of valuable information and a lot of knowledge that can be really useful in this realm that we're presently in. Um, and not only do they do other other people have seen them and that he can prove out of all the thousands of uh, cases that he's studied over the last 40 years that these realms are ontologically real meaning they're, they're being they're real because hundreds and thousands of people have experienced them so all these people have experienced them they were they experienced these places they're real because it can't be that so many people have been to the same places and they come back from different journeys, you know, different substances, different journeys, different countries, different times, and for some reason everyone has seemed to return from very, very similar similar places, or at least places that have the same elements. So that was really interesting. Um, and he kind of coded uh, a few elements that, um, uh, 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 elements of the, of the uh, transpersonal experience, I, I want to kind of go over it with you, and if you wish, um, do you guys have pens? Yeah. Pens. Whoever you have a pen, I invite you to just like take your pen and on the card that we passed out, there's a little space on the bottom that you can kind of write stuff. And if you want, I can just invite you to, um, out of what I'm about to kind of go over, if you feel anything resonating with you, if you feel like there was um, an element that you resonate with, you can even write that down and we can talk about it later. So one of the tenets of the uh, transpersonal spiritual experience, according to Groff, is that the spiritual realm can be experienced through psychedelics by visiting, having kind of like an out-of-body experience. Now, what does this really mean? Um, out-of-body experience meaning we kind of transcend our body, we leave our body. All of a sudden, do you ever get to feel like you can't really feel like your body and you can't walk and you can't feel your hands and everything becomes like a pure state of consciousness? right? Um, maybe even kind of cloudy. Um, the, the complete opposite of being grounded. Like, you know, when we say we're high, what does that really mean? We leave our body. We're high above our body. That's when we're high. Um, so he said that um, the transpersonal state has involves having Perhaps, and by the way, sorry, I just want to say something else. It doesn't mean that you have to have all these elements to have um, a spiritual transpersonal experience. You can just derive a couple of them and it means that you had a transpersonal state. So one of them is having um, an out-of-body experience. Um, it also means, so being a non-physical being, and if you're a state of consciousness, we said that. Also, transcending all dimensions of time and space. Do you ever feel like, um, you know, you take, um, some sort of a substance, and then like you go on a journey with your buddy, and you stop at all these places along the way, right? And then like you stop maybe at the thunder stage, and then maybe you go ahead and decide to like get some water, and you get caught up in something else, and you do a trip to the porta potty, and that seems like five hours sitting on that stall, it's like you're transported into a completely different universe, just being there, and. Uh, and then you decide that you need to get away, you need to get on the mountain, and before you know it, it's already like sunset. And then like, you make your way back to the camp, and on the way back, you pass that porta potty, and you're like, wow, that was like universes ago. <laughs> yeah? Right? Like ages and ages, like where have I been? 
right? There's like time doesn't make any sense. So time all of a sudden is like has a different meaning. Because we're visiting a different dimension of time, which is really neat. Like other places they don't really have the time concept that we do. An hour is not an hour, it could be like twenty days, right? So that's another aspect. And the space as well, and we might remember where we are, but we're not really here consciously subconsciously we're here, but we're not really present to where we are. Um, another element, attachment and detachment from ego reality. So, one of the hallmarks, in my opinion, we've had a debate about this, um, and we will, we shall continue having a debate we about this. We can have it right now. We can have it right now. A duel um, about ego reality. What is what is our ego? There is it's another loaded word. So much that we can say about it. Um, in terms of the psychedelic experience. Um, the ego really is what we acknowledge as who we are, consciously. So if I think right now, I'm thinking, I'm aware that I am Cherie, I'm sitting on this chair, I do all these cool, awesome things, I'm married to this beautiful, awesome human being, um, I live in you know, a house, I partner with these beautiful women, and these are the things I know, or at least I think I know. But there is so much more to who we are than what we really recognize. So that was my ego identity, and beyond that, there's a lot more. So um, it's really difficult in a regular state of consciousness to detach from who we are, and there's again a lot more to say about that. But for some reason, in the psychedelic reality, our ego identity all of it suddenly seems to be shut away. It's a lot easier to talk with people. Things that we think that you know that they're so important to us don't necessarily make so much sense anymore. All of a sudden, we have like a realization: like, why am I so attached to this like particular issue? It doesn't like it's not so important anymore. Um, maybe we start seeing ourselves from like a different, you know, a different realm. And this goes back to the you know the other state of consciousness, the out of body experience. We literally like. We can leave our body and view ourselves from like a metaphysical perspective and look at ourselves and what does that really mean? Is that really all that I am? Or am I so much more? So there is kind of like a crack in the ego identity which allows us to kind of see through the cracks and get a glimpse perhaps into our core self, our true being, which is so vast. And that's it's such a beautiful for me such a beautiful experience and also it could be a very scary experience of the transpersonal realm it could be scary because I was going to talk about this maybe a little bit later but just to kind of say a word challenges that come from the difficult psychedelic experience really all that they are is when we kind of like really try to stay attached to our ego identity like no this is what i know and this is what i, I can't make room for anything else right now this may be scary it's going into the unknown i'm not really sure what what i'm going to find there yes it could be amazing but it could be like scary as shit and i'm i'm not going to know myself anymore who am I without this ego identity? So, a lot of um, challenging experiences, they really come, like they stem from like not being able to detach from that ego identity, and, like really holding on to what we think we know. Goodness, okay, so let's keep going. Um, how are we doing with time? We're fine. All right. <laughs> so another another tenet of the uh, transpersonal spiritual experience, according to Roth, is perinatal stages. Those are really um, you can kind of go through an experience of um, uh, a rebirth, like you go through your birth canal. You go back to your mom's birth canal when she birthed you, either a cesarean or through the, through the uh, vagina, through the birth canal. You can literally go back and kind of relive that experience. And also kind of relive what your mom went through when she was pregnant with you. Which is really beautiful. Um, also, 
being aware of a singular resonance in God. Like, all of a sudden, do you ever find that you're like deep in the mushrooms and like, like you feel like you found God? Like, <laughs> yes. His mama mushroom is like, she's like, a, you know, a servant of God in a way, right? The spirit of the mushroom is a servant of God. So you get a glimpse into God. And then you come out of the experience and you're like, I found, I saw God. This was God the heaven. This was divinity. And it's huge. What am I what do I do with this? It's massive. All this knowledge that all of a sudden I know, like I've been taught all these things, and I suddenly feel like I know the order of the universe. Like everything makes sense all of a sudden. So that's another transpersonal element. The truth, the ultimate truth of the universe. A death and rebirth, you know, we've already said going through the birth canal, but there might also be a death and rebirth of the ego. If the ego identity is somehow shattered and we're able to break through it, or the medicine was able to, able to carry us through it, um, the ego is disintegrates and you go through the journey and then you kind of get back together again. So you're reborn again. You come out of the psychedelic journey like a new person, a new being. Okay. Um, and another cool thing about the transpersonal experience is sometimes also being, we said being aware of God, but also visiting, and Ashley touched upon that as well. Archetypes, archetypes, gods, and deities, like symbols that you feel have a lot of universal wisdom. And those could be really scary because what they are, yes, they're personal, as Ashley said, definitely. And a lot of them also carry um, a really deep understanding of this is actually not just who I am, but this symbol actually resembles like humanity. Everything about humanity, like all the knowledge of humanity, that's the transgenerational um, evolution of mankind has been like put into little symbols like motherhood, like the devil, like um, again, death and rebirth. We said that um, kings and queens, these are all archetypes that have been carried through the years. And we might encounter them, and they can also be, you know, an, an interesting addition to the challenging uh, transpersonal experience because, again, they're so huge, and it's really scary. It might, it might be really scary to face them. So um, that can also cause a really challenging experience. But those archetypes actually um, connect us to the collective unconscious. Now, I really wanted to talk about Carl Jung, and I'm just going to say a few words about him because um, I know we have to wrap up, and we want to do a Q and A. So the archetypes, because they're carried through, um, actually, let me rephrase it. So we have our own personal consciousness. Carl Jung, which was another amazing, uh, he was actually a psychoanalyst uh, at the beginning of last century. He was actually called a modern day shaman. Even though he was completely scientific and he worked with Freud and had his practice in Switzerland, he, he never believed in the psychedelic experience and he always claimed that he never used anything or gave it to his patients. However, if you ever open his, he has a, um, a beautiful manuscript called The Red Book, which is this huge book, it's about this big, and in it is a beautiful album of all these uh, mandalas and just visions, and you look at them and you're like, this man has been on Aya like all of his life. <laughs> Amazing. And so he was really able to kind of like see beyond the scientific side that was presented back in the day and look for like kind of like a spiritual side. So through what he talked about in consciousness, it's really kind of easy to understand what the, the concept of consciousness in psychedelics. And what he said was this. We all have our consciousness, yes. That's our ego identity. Our ego identity, we talked about that. It's only 5% of what we know, of who we are. Meaning 95% the other 95% is everything about ourselves that we have no clue of consciously. It exists within us, but we're not even aware of it, meaning we're only aware of 5% of who we are. 
How powerful is that? <laughs> yes. I see you. And um, I see all of you. 5% and 95% yet to be explored or even aware of. And so much potential. So he recognized that. So he said, okay, 5%, that's my consciousness, it's right here. But where's the 95%? That's our subconscious. Actually, no, our unconscious, not our subconscious. Consciousness and unconsciousness is 95%. So we have our personal consciousness, ego identity, personal unconscious, which is all this stuff, again, that's within us that we're not aware of. But the personal unconscious is derived from a different place, another place, another reality, the, pers the collective unconsciousness. So all those archetypes we talked about, they're all derived from a personal unconsciousness. Sorry, the collective unconscious. The collective unconscious is basically a big pool of knowledge and everything that has been carried throughout humanity that we're all like right now at all times and anywhere where we are, we all share in this. No, this 95% is a collective no, bank knowledge. Bank of knowledge. But how do we get there? What's our portal to this collective unconscious where it has like all the wisdom? Basically, it has the key. It holds, this collective unconscious holds the key to our to mankind. And because he says, because we haven't tapped into it, that's the reason that we're experiencing so many problems in so many levels, or personal psychological problems, or problems as a humanity, because we're really dis we're not, um, we're so separated from that 95%. So he really insisted, Carl Jung really insisted that in order to be whole individuals, and not just whole individuals, like a whole psyche, whole individuals, and a whole humanity, we must be able to explore this collective unconscious. And that is our only gateway to, again, to connection um, and to really like resurrecting ourselves. And the point I'm trying to make, we still have time? Okay. Yeah, but we should like... Okay, a couple of more minutes. Yeah, okay. Okay, cool. Awesome. And I'm really interested in also hearing, we really want to leave a lot of time for q and I'm curious to hear what you guys have to say about this. Um, I'm personally really fascinated by it. To me, like, I really felt like when I read this, like, okay, wow, this is like, this makes so much sense to me. Um, to me, this is basically psychedelic integration. What Carl Jung says, connecting with that unconscious and for me it's, for me it's doing it through psychedelics that's the portal to the unconscious to the collective unconscious um and it's not just a personal journey every time we take medicine yes it's a definitely a personal internal beautiful journey of the self you dive into your own you dive into your personal unconscious but again you're diving to the personal unconscious and you're also tapping into the collective unconscious and how powerful is that so sometimes you know you're again you're doing aya and you're all in the same circle together and you know the shaman always usually some shamans actually work differently but like the medicine man or the woman you can say it's really good to all be in the same room if you have to purge do it in the same room like don't leave the room why because we're sharing in the collective unconscious we're having this amazing collective experience and oftentimes after you're done with the journey you know, you speak with one another and you, and you realize you've been to the same place, you've seen the same things. That's the collective unconscious. Which is really neat. Um, that's what um, uh, Sam Graf talked about, again, going to the same place. And the reason that uh, I'm bringing that up, and the reason that I think integration is so important, and the benefits of integration, now I'm going to try to kind of tie it all together. So the transpersonal experience, the spiritual experience, which, again, spiritual, loaded word, let's try to forget about it. The other realm, 
the transpersonal, going beyond this dimension, tapping into other states of consciousness, altered states of consciousness, the collective unconscious. So again, the bottom is the collective pool. Above that, kind of like a tree when you think about it. We kind of look at a tree, like the figure of a tree. The tree is rooted in the ground, in the earth. Deep in the earth, the roots, imagine it to be the collective unconscious. And we all, like, we're all, we all sing from the same earth, the same planet. We're all connected to that, feet on the ground. That's grounding. That's why it's so important, because, again, you feel the connection. And um, so that's, you're grounded to the collective. You're never, you're never alone. And then the trunk, again, your, our ego identity. Sorry, not yet, not the ego identity. What holds the ego identity, the trunk, okay, that's going to be our personal unconscious. Because again, it stems, we derive from the collective unconscious. On top of that, the, the branches, that's going to be our ego identity, our consciousness. So collective unconscious, personal unconscious, personal consciousness, and what comes on top of that? Anything missing from this equation? Collective consciousness. What did you say? Collective consciousness. Collective consciousness. <laughs> Collective consciousness. So just like, again, we have a pool of the knowledge. There is an, the, the leaves that are stemming from the branches are the collective consciousness. This is where we strive to be. Because what's the point of going into the unconscious? The unconscious, all the darkness, the shadow material. By going into these places, we're really trying to shed light on these really dark, could be very dark places, and shed light and raise them to the surface, raise them into light consciousness. By raising them into light consciousness, we make things real. And by making them real, all the beautiful things and images and knowledge and archetypes and wisdom and the godliness and the divinity that are in the pool of the collective unconscious and the psychedelic experience, we can raise them to the surface, to the collective consciousness. And how beautiful would it be, you know, when we all do all this personal inner work. Yes, it's very personal and so important for our own self-development and growth in this lifetime. But we have so much responsibility as individuals because our own integration process really directly contributes to the personal, to the collective consciousness. That's really an awakening. That's really bring us, bringing us all into the light. And um, for me, I think it's one of the reasons that I come to these transformational festivals, because this is a, a space to play, to really enlarge our consciousness and, and expand and come together as a humanity. And then we go back home and integrate the experience and try to bring that into real life. And that's how we, that's how we cause the awakening. That's the creation um, and awakening of our consciousness. And uh, I think I think I'm gonna end here. Um, yeah. Oh, thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much, ladies. So um, the last thing that we're gonna kind of um, talk about um, is. The services that Interspace Integration um, will be offering, um, that we offer now, um, we have a couple of things. The first thing we, that we do is we offer a once a month community meeting, um, currently in Los Angeles, but we're looking to eventually expand to other cities, um, for people to really be able to connect and have um, a connection to make them feel like they aren't alone, to be able to share their experience, to be able to sit and listen to other people's experiences, and really be able to create a support system um, where people feel safe and, um, and supported and loved to be able to process their experience. 
We also offer individual services and group services. We do group intensives, um, which is like a one month intensive that is four groups and two individual sessions. And what that does is we actually really go deep into self-care and somatic work and spiritual work and really start to help people identify what is unconscious, what is the collective conscious, what does that mean for you. And we're able to really provide the space for people to go deep within their own work because a lot of times these processing these states can be confusing, can be intense. And so um, we're offering that. If you don't live in Los Angeles, we also offer um, Skype, Google Chat sessions, and things like that. So if you or somebody you know is having some challenging, challenging experiences with integration, um, we encourage you to reach out to us via email, check out our website, reach out to the AWARE Project or on Facebook, be able to connect with us so we can really start providing support to our community. Because the three of us have committed ourselves to, to creating um, service and support to our community. Um, we also have been offering daily integration work here at Lighting in a Bottle, and we're going to have our final integration circle um, tomorrow at noon, um, behind, like around the Zendo harm reduction space behind Boogie. So if you wanted to come by, uh, and you can ask where we're going to be, check in with the Zendo and say, hey, I'm looking for inner space integration, and they'll let you know. We'll probably be under a tree somewhere. Um, hanging out if you want to come um, and share your experience with us. We would love to hear it. Um, and so really we continue to expand our services. What we really want from you as our community is to come to us and talk to us about what you need. And we're going to be able to create a space for um, tailoring services to individuals. And so if you really need help finding a community, help finding a therapist in your area, help with um, just being able to have somebody safe to chat to, check in with, things like that. Our goal is to be able to create safe space and safe community for effective, healthy integration of all three states. Um, and so please come talk to us afterwards. We're about to have a Q&A. Ashley's going to kind of wrap it up with um, our final thoughts. Thanks, Erica. So touching on what Erica was saying about, uh, this is a co-creative process, and I was, as I was saying before, we're, we all each have our own little gems and pearls of wisdom that we're sharing with each other. And, you know, we maybe have been thinking about, the three of us maybe have been thinking about psychedelic integration more than you have, but every single one of us holds one of those gems, and I encourage you to share those with each other, and. and Let's co-create this safe space together because these are incredible tools. And the more that we release this culturally imposed shame on using these things, the better they're going to work. So I do not feel ashamed about using psychedelic medicines for my own personal work. They have increased my beingness and my heart in ways that I have no words for. And that is a God-given right for all of us. So please use your voices, share your experiences. We are all in this together. We are moving into the psychedelic information age. The psychedelic age has been going on for millennia and we have only just lost it in our Western culture in the last several hundred years. And now that the psychedelic age and the information age are colliding, there is no way to put closed Pandora's box. This information is not going away. And the more people that are touched by these things, the more people it changes and the faster it spreads. This is a huge tool in our human evolution. And that knowledge, that knowing that's deep inside of me, that gives me so much hope and trust in this beautiful, beautiful unfolding universe. 
So with that, we're going to close up for a Q&A, and we have some poem, one poem we're going to read at the end. No, I think we should read it now. Okay, so we're going to read the poem now. Yeah. And then we guys can have a card later. So we're going to read three parts here. Can I do part one? Oh, wait. The first one? Yeah. Okay. I'll do the third one. Okay, so, yeah. Um, just close your eyes because this is this is one of my favorite poems and I regularly read it on, a, on an everyday basis. This is by Courtney Walsh. It's called Dear Human. Dear Human, you've got it all wrong. You didn't come here to master unconditional love. This is where you came from and where you'll return. You came here to learn personal love, universal love, messy love, sweaty love, crazy love, broken love, whole love, infused with divinity, lived through the grace of stumbling, demonstrated through the beauty of messing up often. You didn't come here to be perfect. You already are. You came here to be gorgeously human flawed and fabulous and rising again into remembering but unconditional love stop telling that story love in truth doesn't need any adjectives it doesn't require modifiers it doesn't require the condition of perfection it only asks you to show up and do your best, that you stay present and feel fully, that you shine and fly and laugh and cry and hurt and heal and fall and get back up and play and work and live and die as you. It's enough. It's plenty. And with that, we'd like to open up to a Q&A. If you guys have any questions, feel free to come up to the microphone and um, take the microphone out of the mic stand and hold it a little bit closer to your face if you guys have questions so we can hear you on the recording. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say like closer. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to say thank you. You guys are all so lovely. Uh, my question, so I used psychedelics um, when I was younger, and uh, since then, I when I was younger, I had very powerful like experiences and breakthroughs that changed my life and everything. And recently, I I enjoy them, but I don't necessarily have the breakthrough experiences that I once had. And I was wondering if you guys have any advice on how to come back to that and experience that in the same type of way. Yeah, I think my, yeah, my background is in, in science, and so I kind of come about this in a sort of scientific method in that it's all about experimentation. Like, right now, maybe psychedelics are not the tool that's calling you, and there are many other supportive practices that move energy in different kinds of ways, and finding other tools, whether it be breath work or yoga or tai chi or self-deprivation tanks or holotropic breath work there's a whole host of fabulous tools and the more that you you know get you know you're part of this community and you find out what other people are using i think that kind of alternating between these different ways of creating portals for transformation can be really effective because there's not going to be one thing that works all the time yeah, I'd, I'd also like to um, <clears throat> to mention in the harm reduction realm of things um, that if you're looking for something like a more intense experience, it is unbelievably important and necessary to have a sitter, to have a support group, to be able to to communicate, to make sure that you are safe when you're really like seeking these breakthrough experiences, that you create a container for yourself that that is consciously providing safety. Um, and so with that, really being able to sit down and set intention and check in with yourself, 
about what medicine is calling to you. I mean, it might be Kundalini Yoga, it might be holotropic breath work, it might be a combination of different things. But if you're, you know, if you're seeking those like breakthrough experiences, it is necessary for you to create a safe container for that. Does that make sense? Okay. I would also like to say something. I would also like to say something. Um, so this is this is what's cool because see we're all so different, but we all also have our own perspective. And I'd like to offer like maybe kind of like a more um, metaphysical perspective. So it's really cool to kind of look. For, for me, one thing that I love about psychedelics is it really looks like a story to me. From the time that I started using them up until this day, like throughout the, the few years that I've been experimenting, it's all like one long journey, one long story. And every journey has like, you know, its own lesson perhaps. And they each communicate with one another and the spirits communicate with one another. And even the spaces in between, it's also the same story. And if you're currently in a time where you might not be receiving the experiences that you're after, the transformational experiences that you're after, it's also part of the story. So perhaps in the beginning of the story, there had to be some sort of a leap, a leap of faith, which you definitely took, and now like you're like so in it and you're yearning for more, it seems, and I think it's such a beautiful, like raw, vulnerable thing that you're putting yourself out there and willing and requesting it. But it's what to request, like Erica said, intention is very important, but if it's not there at the moment, that's fine. That's also part of it. And you know, perhaps later, as you keep going and you keep doing, and you you know you find other practices to mediate with, like was mentioned, um, you might actually find that this period where you, you're getting maybe less lessons and less transformative experience, this might have been the most transformational time of all, <laughs> in a different way, right? So I think it's kind of cool to keep that in mind. It's all part of the same story. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, hi, thank you so much. Um, that was awesome. Can you hold it a little closer? It's interesting. Yeah, so the transpersonal experiences that like, really rings true to me. Um, and I don't like what you guys are doing. I'm actually doing um, sort of a similar thing up in San Francisco. It's called the Holistic Underground. Sweet. And, yeah, yeah, we do healing balance. Let's connect. Oh uh, yeah, please. Um, and so I guess I'm. It's more of an open-ended question because I feel like the psychedelic realm is kind of. It, it is an access point into different realms, and I really not feel like Be what I'm realizing is that is an access point to different realms. And so, um, and you know, it's like almost you have these psychedelic experiences, and you're able to like unlock um, these different realms. And I'm wondering. Um, how do you go about finding like the correct types of um, experiences that reflect to you, like um, the patterning? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's, that's the crux of my question. I mean, I think the patterning that happens, um, you know, it's just it's just transformative because I see the patterning happening, like music, somatics, um, language. Um, and I'm wondering how we can access that pattern and print on our own kind of higher Patterning, are you referring to archetypes? Is that yeah, what I'm hearing? Right, symbols and um, the archetypes, and also like the patterning when you're on psychedelics. Um, you see like the, in, the intricately interwoven patterning of like people that art, right? So it's that patterning, um, that symbology, I feel like it's. It's like something to a lot of different but yeah, just one thing in this phase. So, so how to access it and how to kind of embody it? Right. right. Yes. Okay. So um, I would think that again, intention is everything. I don't think we really talked about that enough. And there's so much to talk about, and our time is limited. But intention is so important. Um, before the experience, if you have specific things you wish to work on, it's good to kind of take a few minutes and settle down, and even a few days actually. If you're really serious, you're going into like you know a journey of a few days, or the Amazon, a few days, even maybe a month. Sit down, write what you want, figure out what you want, what you're looking to get. Also, important to have it into um, blah blah blah. Intention is different from expectations. Really important to to distinguish between the two. 
Um, so I think the intentions might really help. And afterwards, in terms of like the integration of how to kind of derive meaning, I think um, supplementary practices are super important. So what is really integration? We talked about like kind of, you know, the general idea, but it's really like, what are the tools? So the tools are journaling, movement, yoga, expression, taking a few days after the experience to sit with it. Like don't try to immediately go back, get back into your life like nothing happened. Because when you do that, you're blocking, like it's like you take all that beautiful bank of knowledge and you throw it out the window. It's just like you're blocking yourself to it. So try to keep open in that beautiful, vulnerable space. So don't turn on the television. If you can get away from Facebook, even better. You know, take a few days to yourself. I like to write a lot. Ashley, you know, again, does a lot of yoga, movement. I like to also walk, dancing, um, prayer. Talking to people, so important to really find someone that you can speak with. Again, someone in the community, someone that you trust. If you can't, don't have anyone in the community that you feel like you can trust with this experience, you can now there is professional assistance that's what we try to provide um, talk to someone talking even it doesn't even have to make any sense sometimes it's like you kind of see something but you really don't and just talking about it just by talking you can really derive things out of this conversation anything else you want to add so yeah it, expression create form thank you for that question this is a perfect segue in my next question Kind of in my own journey, I had a crazy awakening experience in India, and basically went crazy. And I was trying to figure out what the fuck was happening to me, and I went through all these experiences and didn't have you guys could be. And I really wish I did. So first, thank you, because as, and then just in my own integration journey, I've tried everything I've had. Usually two or three hours of some sort of practice of being really traumatic and yoga movement. And uh, some things that have really helped me have been things like EMDR and Sanji Ami, uh, really in the cinematic of the class. I started exploring, I started engineering, so I started exploring technology for health and integration. And specifically, uh, alpha and treatment has been like, probably my single biggest integration tool that's been getting some. I work for a startup that uh, uses light and sound to help you resonate with the human resonance of Earth. And that's been like the single most powerful integration practice for a long time. And it soups up everything else like the psychology. And you know, we're asking the physical level and the energetic level and emotional and also psychology and the realm of story all the way up to the spirit and the unconscious. But adding ways to integrate those together can help you on the journey. So, I don't know if the question there was, was just like, hey, technology is here too, it's going to help with this, it's going to be really cool. Yes. Yeah, thank you. And this is why we're coming together as a community to be able to share these tools together. So thank you for sharing your your, your pearl. I, and then also to speak to your, you had a Kundalini awakening, you know, experience essentially. And, and uh, you know, this we, you know, we, we're talking specifically about psychedelics right now, but, you know, this is an altered space. And I can't remember the yogi who said this right now, but he was um, he was asked what he thought about Bikram Yoga, and he said, all trees are growing towards the light, and I think that all of these different tools are all pointing at the same thing, so thank you for sharing some of those other tools that, you know, we're going to continue figuring out more together. And one of the things that I find really um, amazing, besides providing kind of this like psychotherapy and counseling support that we're doing, is there are these other tools like EMDR. Um, I spent the past year and a half working at a clinic um, based in Los Angeles that does EEG neurofeedback for depression, anxiety, um, ADHD, and sleep disorder. Um, and so we're constantly moving forward in, in the realm of technology and neuroscience to be able to provide people um, support and relief without using um, medication, without using antidepressants and things like that. Mind you, 
Although we, we live in a current society in which we, I feel like we can all agree that people might be over-medicated or too quick to move to pharmacology, um, it's also really um, important to recognize that there are cases in which um, pharmacological interventions tend to be the best thing, whether they are long-term or short-term or, or short, short when you're going through crisis and trouble integrating. Um, and so besides, and we're constantly developing, it's the reason that MAPS is doing MDMA, MDMA research, it's the reason that HAFTR is doing psilocybin re research, is we are trying to discover new and better ways to treat um, mental health symptoms, mental health um, diagnoses in the, um, in the world. Um, you know, MDMA, currently, if you look at the MDMA research, specifically MDMA-assisted psychotherapy to treat uh, treatment-resistant post-traumatic stress, it is seven times more effective than the current um, FDA-approved treatments. And so as we move forward into phase three, as we move forward into attempting to reschedule things like cannabis and MDMA and psilocybin, we are constantly developing better pharmacological interventions to be able to support people and get them the treatment that they actually need. Um, in addition to kind of using this like new technology or color therapy or um, or you know different breathwork techniques and things like that. So thank you so much for sharing your experience, um, and I'm really excited to kind of see where the field of integration um, develops over the over the next couple of decades. I think we're we're out of time, but if you want to one, I think if we can answer it really quick, yeah, yeah, of course. So thank you again for being here. And the question you, you talked about mental health a little bit. My question is around mental health. Is um, recently I came to this view that the mental health pretty much arises as a as a result of some sort of blockage in the development of the person, right? So um, is that what what is kind of your take on that on, on that approach and that philosophy? Does that make sense to you? Or? Yeah, it definitely makes sense to me. Um, I uh, again I'll reiterate with the the quick to medicate field that Western medicine has. Um, yeah, there are some people that are having spiritual blockages that don't want to go through the lengthy integration process to kind of absolutely resolve that. Like at some point, like so there are people out there that are like, like this pill will fix it, I will take this pill, right? And there are some people out there that are like, I don't want to take this pill, I actually want to do the work to process through it. Now, that doesn't mean that there, like, chemical imbalances, neurological imbalances don't exist. They do. That, like, there are people that have physiological symptoms that require medication. Um, I don't think that everybody who is on medication has those. Um, and so I think it's a case-by-case -case, case scenario. I think... You know, as we discover things like multi-generational trauma, and we discover things um, like like negative patterns of behavior that have developed over time due to lack of support and lack of coping skills that are now manifesting themselves as what we would say a diagnosable mental health disorder. Um, I think that it exists as well. And so I think there are definitely two sides to this point. You know, I have a strong belief that there are a lot that there there is a percentage of the population that has either a neurological imbalance or a chemical imbalance that isn't going to be solved by as, as like as much of a yoga practice as you could possibly develop. Like you can't fix like a, a physiological problem. Um, through alternative interventions. Sometimes medication is the best intervention. And what we're doing in integrating psychedelics into research is hopefully we are going to be developing developing treatments and medications that have less side effects, that have that are more effective, that can really be able to uh, to to treat the 
the root of the problem. And a lot of times the root of the problem is psychosomatic, and a lot of times it is like a genuine chemical imbalance. So I really think that it's a case-by-case -case scenario, and I think that the current model that we have with the pharmaceutical industries and the way that doctors are prescribing things is not the best way to do it, but for a percentage of the population out there, it actually is the best way. So with that, um, yeah, we'll, we'll close up here, and um, yeah, I mean, we're all figuring this out together, you know? And uh, the more that we experience, uh, or that we experiment and connect with each other, we find new tools, and it's just gonna continue evolving. We don't know where it's going, and we don't understand everything yet, but we're figuring things out bit by bit. And this is all part of the process. We're exactly where we should be at every single moment. So thank you all so much for being here. If you would like a award project sticker to find out about our events in Los Angeles, you can come up and get one. We have the poem that we write up here. And with that, we'll be at the back for questions. Thank you. Oh, and be careful of the altar. Yeah, we'll, we'll come down. We'll come down to you.